Okay, well, I think we should start. Are you, are you okay with that, Christine? I'll get my good. Okay, well, look, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming along tonight to the fourth instalment of our DEA's After Hour webinar series. Um, my name is Kate Wiley. I'll be facilitating the event today. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce to you all Dr. Christine Barnden, who is an obstetrician joining us from Tasmania. Hello, Christine, how are you? I am very well, thank you, Kate. Thank you. Um, so yes, as I said, Christine is an obstetrician. She's a member of the Climate Reality Leadership Corps um, and has been a long-term active member of Doctors for the Environment Australia. Tonight, she's going to present to us on women's health and climate change. Um, you know, we do know that climate change is a gendered issue and that improving women's access to education, to reproductive rights, um, improving women's equity is something that's very important as far as climate change mitigation and resilience. So I'm being very interested and really looking forward to hearing Christine's talk. Um, after she presents, we're going to have a panel discussion. We'll be joined by Dr. Anna. Oh, sorry, Anna Navidad, who's a midwife, I believe, um, who's running a bit late from work, which is what happens to us all in this world. Um, she's very passionate about the need for clinicians to be advocates in the climate health space, um, is, knows a lot about nonviolent direct action. Hello, Anna, how are you? She's just coming on now. Um, and also knows a lot about um, the health effects of climate change on pregnant women. Um, so before we proceed any further, I'd just like to acknowledge country. So the nation we call Australia is stolen land. Um, First Nations people have never ceded their sovereignty of their land and respect is owed to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island nations and people. Hello, Anna, nice to see you. Um, I'm on Ghana land and greetings to a group of people in Ghana is Namani. So Namani to you all. And I do think it's a sign of respect if people would like to acknowledge the land that they're on by writing the name in the chat. Um, just a little bit more housekeeping. Um, we've got a questions and answer little um, section there for people to ask their questions and then I'll be addressing them. We'll be addressing them in the panel discussion afterwards. And also at the top of the chat, there's a link for RACGP and ACRA members if you want to get your CPD points for coming along to this presentation, please fill that in and I'll remind you about that again at the end of the talk. All right, so that's enough talking from me. Um, whenever you're ready, Christine, if you'd like to share your slides and away we go. Okay, thank you. Uh, just a moment. Um... Sorry, guys, just escape out of that one. And take your time. Yes. Um, all right. So thank you. Thank you, Kate, um, in particular, for inviting me to talk. I'm on Muanina country, uh, and I'd like to start by paying my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So women's health and climate change is actually, it's a huge topic and I apologise in advance if I don't cover everything that you're expecting, but hopefully we can also address things in the question and answer session. What, I'm, what I've chosen to do is to start by just giving a framework for thinking about climate change and women's health, which is what sort of came to me as, as I prepared this talk. Um, because I'm talking to predominantly Australian health professionals, I'm going to focus on heat and air pollution and their effects on women and particularly effects on pregnancy because I think these are probably the questions that you'll be asked the most as health professionals in Australia. I'll talk briefly about women and natural disaster and then I'll also once again, sadly, only briefly talk about um, some popula population and re reproductive rights. So, when I first became involved with climate activism and giving talks about health and climate change, I thought it looked like this. Uh, the world is warming. It results in increased heat events, poor quality air and water, extreme weather events, 
increase in infectious diseases, food insecurity, and economic impacts, including uh, the stress on health resources. Very quickly, you come to realize that the causes of climate change, and the ones that really came out for me, um, industrial agriculture and our food system, fossil fuel use and urban design, have their own health effects that very much interact with the effects of climate change. Um, and I guess when we talk about the co-benefits of climate action, we're talking about the health effects that are more immediate that we can achieve by addressing these things. The health effects of these, when um, applied to pregnancy, result in effects on health throughout the lifespan for an, a, a fetus that's been exposed in utero. Quickly, you also realise that climate change is also just one symptom of uh, the um, insults we're um, imposing on the environment and that uh, other environmental insults, um, loss of biodiversity, pollution, both um, exacerbate and interact with climate change impacts, but also can have their own particular health impacts. And I think when I think about this, um, particularly the endocrine disrupting effects of pesticides and plastic pollution um, are an emerging major issue when it comes to reproductive health. Then you've got to think about the, the causes of the causes, our social structures, our beliefs, our values, our history, and not just that they contribute to the causes of climate change and perpetuate them and are stopping us from addressing them properly, but they are also linked to the social determinants of health, of which gender inequity is just one. The social determinants of health very much affect whether or not you're exposed, I, I guess, to the um, effects of climate change. So somebody who is socially disadvantaged is more likely to be living in substandard housing, more likely to be in, living in an area where there's air, air pollution, for example. And they also very much have their own um, health effects um, on families and, and women. What is particularly important, I think, when we're looking at pregnancy and reproductive health is that they don't just add on to um, other environmental health effects, their mechanisms are quite similar and, and they exacerbate and potentiate the other effects on health and pregnancy. So I'm just going to just zoom in on this bottom right corner, um, health through the lifespan. We, we know that environmental effects on health, um, so nutritional, metabolic, uh, physical environment, the stress, psychological environment, all start actually before conception by affecting gametes and even you know, altering DNA in, in the gametes prior to conception. And then once conception has occurred, affecting the placenta and the developing embryo by a, a number of pathways. Uh, so what we can see is that environmental effects will have um, specific effects on pregnancy that are very measurable and are often the outcomes of the studies that I'll talk about. So particularly stillbirth, still term, stillbirth, preterm birth and growth restriction, but also that there are a huge sort of underlying effect on susceptibility to illness, both uh, physical and psycho, psychological illness through the lifespan. And so when we're talking about pregnancy effects of environmental insults, it's not just the obvious things, but these other things are going on in the background and affecting our, our future generations. The other thing that I just wanted people to think about as I'm talking is how are you going to use the information? If you're going to talk to someone, who are you talking to? I think if you're talking just to the average pregnant woman in Australia who's concerned about heat or air pollution, you can tell her that although there are effects on pregnancy, they're actually pretty low, pretty small, and they're very modifiable. But if you're talking to someone who is socially disadvantaged, who has a lot of other things going on, it's actually a little bit harder to be so reassuring. And also that woman is less likely perhaps to be able to escape or, or modify the uh, exposure that she has. If you're looking at policy or population level, those very small individual risks become quite su substantial population health risks. And if you're looking at an advocacy activism sort of level, then I don't know, it's just, it's just immoral. And 
I hope that will also come out and help to inform conversations that you have. So I'm going to start with a clinical scenario. Jess is a 26 year old woman. She's got a healthy eight year old girl from a previous pregnancy, uh, low BMI, non-smoker, and she's about 24 weeks gestation. She sees you in your clinic and she tells you that because of housing insecurity, she's living in a caravan at the back of her parents' house with her partner and her daughter. Uh, it's the height of summer, the area is affected by bushfires, and she's, she tells you she's worried about the effects of heat and stress and smoke on her pregnancy. So what can you tell her? I'll start with heat and also just start with on the right, the physiological response to heat. So environmental heat will um, result in an increase in body temperature, but then there's a physiological response where cutaneous vasodilation and sweating in particular um, help to dissipate heat and also will institute behavioural change. We'll, we'll seek shade, we'll, we'll seek cold, we'll have a drink. So compared to men, women with a background high metabolic rate do have um, a decreased ability to dissipate heat physiologically. In pregnancy, where you've already got cutaneous vasodilation, you've already got um, uh, um, a higher background um, basal temperature, you've really got nowhere to move from there. You've already made all the adjustments that you can. And so the effects of heat in pregnancy, the mechanisms are, yeah, well, look, there's several putative mechanisms. One might be that... Um, Dehydration, inflammation and oxidative stress will affect the blood flow to the uterus and placenta. Heat shock proteins may damage the fetus and placenta. And there may be heat stress activation of the maternal hypothalamic pituitary access, access, sorry. And so these are the things that might underlie some of the things that I'll be talking about over the next few slides. Uh, also, once again, socioeconomic and cultural factors can affect women's ability to initiate behavioral changes. And the one thing that really sticks with me, um, an article that I looked at, which was discussing a, a much higher death rate amongst women in rural India compared to men during heat waves. One of the major factors that they considered related to sanitation. So in poor rural areas, women would get up before sunrise to go to the toilet so they could do it privately and safely in the dark. Then they'd stay inside and basically restrict fluids all day so that they could last until dark to go out to the toilet again. In a heat wave, living inside in a closed environment and continuing to restrict fluids that um, contributed to deaths. So um, cultural factors are really, really important. So the evidence around heat and pregnancy outcome, a lot of studies, very heterogeneous, um, but um, Consistently, what has been shown, um, increased risk of preterm birth and early term birth, increased risk of low birth weight, stillbirth, poor condition at birth, increased risk of infant death, and first trimester exposure has been linked to congenital heart defects and an increased risk of miscarriage. So there doesn't appear to be any particular critical exposure window. It applies right through pregnancy and the effects can be immediate, delayed or cumulative. Climatization is very important. So what we see is that um, heat exposure early in the summer season has a lot more effect than heat exposure later in the summer season when people are acclimatized. And obviously important, just the, the background heat that you're used to. Um, effects are exacerbated by air pollution and socioeconomic factors. So because the studies are so heterogeneous with all their different definitions, there's not really any, any meta-analyses. So I was just going to run through a couple of studies to give a feel for the degree of effect. So a um, couple of big US studies. Uh, in the first one here, looking at uh, exposure to heat waves, they found that there was a 13% increased risk of preterm birth for women who were experiencing a heat wave during late gestation. Um, so if you're in a community where your risk of preterm birth background is about 7%, that takes you up, up to about 8%. So if you're an average worried woman, well, yep, there's a, there is an increased risk, but it is really not that high. Looking then at a study that looked at uh, heat wave associated preterm birth across the USA, they calculated up to 5% more children were born on unpredictably hot days um, and that hot weather in total caused about 25,000 babies 
each year to be born all year, to be born all earlier than they would have been otherwise. And they calculated an average loss of about six days, but um, losses of gestation up to about two weeks. And one thing that we're very aware of in obstetrics in the last few years is the um, short and long-term health effects of early term delivery. So we're doing everything we can to get um, to keep babies in utero till about 39 weeks. And two weeks can make a really big difference to health ongoing. Um, stillbirth, a couple of studies here show that just as the temperature rises, there is um, a proportionate increase in, in stillbirth. Uh, the 10.4% the 10 change per five degree increase in apparent temperature is when you have something relatively rare like stillbirth, once again, not a high risk for the individual woman. But if you look across the population, there will be women who have stillbirths who would not have otherwise. Um, once again, younger, less educated mothers and interestingly, male fetuses were more vulnerable. An Australian study, the second one I'm, I've got down there, um, looked at different heat wave definitions and different uh, windows of exposure and found that early pregnancy was actually the critical exposure time for stillbirth and postulated that this, this was probably something to do with placental development. Um, so yes, there is an effect of heat on pregnancy. Um, so what do you advise people who are concerned? You, look, you, your grandmother could come up with this advice, avoid exposure to heat, avoid strenuous activity outside in the hottest part of the day, wear loose fitting clothes and stay hydrated. So I needed a picture. I Googled heat advice in pregnancy. Here's, here's this lovely lady. We need a few changes. She needs a hat. She needs a shirt. For goodness sake, she needs a reusable water bottle. But what she has got and what she's done very sensibly is that she's got the good sense to live in a nice leafy neighbourhood. And this is where I, the, what we as a nation really need to look at is our housing and our urban planning. You look at these urban heat islands, they are often the newer suburbs built out, built out um, sort of around in the periphery of cities, but they can be poorer inner city neighbourhoods as well. And you're looking at up to a four degrees increase in air temperature or even an 80 degrees, uh, surface temperatures up to 80 degrees. You've got housing with poor ventilation and poor insulation. So people are relying on air conditioning to stay cool, may not be able to afford it. If they can afford it, that's contributing to greenhouse gases. Lack of infrastructure and public transport, may not be able to afford it once again. So there's social isolation and the stress of that contributing to the poor outcomes. And once again, if you are getting a new car, you're contributing to greenhouse gases. So here's a really good illustration. This is a thermal map of the Western suburbs of Adelaide where I grew up. And what you can see on the left, that's air temperature. So up to a four degrees centigrade increase in temperature. Um, and then on the right, we're looking at surface temperature. And here in the industrial parts of Port Adelaide, you're up to 80 degrees, down by the beach, the airport, nice and grassy, you're in, in the teens, or all at the same time on the same day. And what you can then do is you can superimpose your map of socioeconomic disadvantage. And my goodness, doesn't it look almost exactly the same? So trees and green space, reduce heat, absorb, absorb air pollution and carbon dioxide, positive effects on mental and physical health. And when you're talking to people who might be concerned about effects um, on pregnancy and effect on developing fetuses, these things have been shown to be able to modify the effects of um, adverse fetal programming, both with maternal exposure um, whilst pregnancy and for exposure of young children outside of pregnancy. Um, so moving on to air pollution, multiple, multiple sources, industrial transport, dust storms, bushfires, also air, indoor air pollution. I'll touch on both in developing countries and in Australia. Just a quick revision, air pollution is basically anything that's in the air that shouldn't be. Um, so there are gases, particulate matter, I think is where a lot of the research has been. And the finer you get, the more likely it is to get right into the lungs, right into the bloodstream. And when we're talking about pregnancy, into and across the placenta. Um, and then many, many other organic and inorganic chemicals that uh, can be in the air. 
and affect health. I won't go into the general health effects of air pollution, that's a whole other talk, but just to say that women do appear to have increased susceptibility to environmental toxins, and once again, pregnant women even more so. They've got increased ventilation, they've got increased cardiac output, um, changes in immune function and resistance of and insulin resistance mean that they've been shown to both have increased blood con concentrations of pollutants, but also where you, you've got your cardiovascular stresses, uh, they're much more vulnerable to it because they've already got those cardiovascular changes happening. So air pollution in pregnancy has been linked to preterm birth, growth restriction, hypertension, diabetes, stillbirth, infertility, miscarriage, and in children who were exposed in utero, respiratory, neurological, and cardiovascular morbidity and obesity. Once again, a lot of studies, a lot of heterogeneity, they don't all show it, but like these links do come up time and again. Um, mechanism, mechanisms of action, probably primarily inflammation and oxidative stress affecting the placenta, and that changes placental perfusion, um, advanced placental aging, but also pollutants are increasingly being found to actually be in the placenta. So that little that little white dot there is black carbon that was found on the fetal side of the human placenta. Polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons have been found in the cord blood of neonates and have been correlated with uh, developmental effects. And animal studies have also shown pollutants in various organs and once again, correlating with, with organ function. Um, so I'll just go through a couple of studies. There, there is a meta-analysis on, on pollution, um, which is a worldwide meta-analysis and they showed an odds ratio of 1.24 for preterm birth with every 10 microgram per meter cubed increase in PM 2.5. And I'll put that into context in a minute. Worldwide, it's thought that about 2.7 million preterm births or 18% of the total are due to air pollution or attributed to air pollution exposure. And about half of these are um, from indoor air pollution. So in Australia, average PM 2.5 levels in say Sydney or Newcastle, about 10 micrograms per meter cubed. On average during the bushfire season of 19 to, 2019 to 20, it was up to about 26, but there were days and places where it was a lot higher than that. One thing that I find particularly sobering, um, a group that assessed air pollution levels at busy intersections during rush hour found values up to 280 micrograms per meter cubed or more than 10 times what the nearest air monitoring stations were showing and this is you know this this is very relevant for women who live or work in quite industrial areas that they, they'll be getting those levels of, of exposure uh, this is a report by Greenpeace that looked at um, low birth weight in Australia that was could be attributed to women just living in the vicinity of coal-fired power plants. They estimated probably about 845 extra cases of low birth weight in Australia, just attributable to coal-fired power generation. Um, little, low birth weight could be related to either preterm birth or growth restriction. They didn't really tease that out. Um, bushfire smoke, which I think is what uh, most people are talking about, the biggest study so far is from Colorado, um, looked at over 500,000 pregnancies over a number of years, and they combined birth registry data with um, PM 2.5 levels from ground-based and remote sensing um, monitors. So they showed that in the first trimester, per additional one microgram per meter cubed, you know, a 5.7 gram decrease in birth weight, an increased uh, odds of gestational uh, diabetes or of gestational hypertension. And then in the second trimester, once again, we're seeing increased risks of diabetes and hypertension, but um, also now seeing an increased risk of preterm birth. Australian studies, I think there's a lot, of, lot happening now, looking at women who were exposed to the bushfires of 1920, uh, nothing published yet. So far, the biggest group has been the women who were exposed to the Hazelwood coal mine fire, which burned for over six weeks um, back in 2014. They did show a significant increase in risk of gestational diabetes, not in any of the other um, risks, but probably because it was underpowered. 
And follow-up studies have shown that children who are exposed in utero were more likely to have um, upper respiratory tract infections in childhood. Um, I think we need to be a little bit careful about this. The, the, there are a lot of studies that show downstream neurocognitive effects of air pollution exposure. They're from places where there are very high chronic background levels. Um, so industrial cities in the US, Poland, um, but they do consistently show that exposure to air pollution is associated with decrease in IQ, even structural brain changes on MRI, behavioural disorders and autism. And that little um, picture down the bottom just shows the degree to which the brain changes and develops in complexity as you go through pregnancy. And then that continues in early childhood. So it is, it's growing rapidly and it is so vulnerable to any sort of toxic insult. Indoor air pollution, globally, as we said, it's responsible for a lot of deaths, um, particularly in young children, and also responsible for um, a lot of greenhouse gases. And that's primarily using open um, stoves to cook on. In Australia, it's, it's probably much more of a chemical thing. There's a lot of household chemicals they're exposed to. Um, I had no idea. I was really horrified when I started reading about this. Um, but it's thought that indoor health pollution, uh, indoor air pollution probably costs the um, Australian community about 18, about $12 billion per year in its health effects. Because we spend 90% of our time indoors and because if you're looking at heat and air pollution events, we're going to be spending a lot more time indoors, this is really important. And once again, just as a... Um, as an illustration of the degree of effect, a Swedish study that looked at cleaners who were just using just common household cleaners, um, obviously a lot more than most of us do, but over a few decades, they found that their lung damage was equivalent to smoking about 20 cigarettes a day. So what can we tell women? If there is an air pollution event, um, bushfire, dust storm, stay inside. But no house is so well insulated as to protect entirely from the smoke event. And I remember um, the ex-college of the ex-president of Ranscog tweeting during the bushfires about smoke in the delivery suite at Canberra Hospital. Um, and this is the time when you have to be, when you can actually talk to people about indoor air pollution. You know, don't burn candles, don't smoke, you know, just just try try as well as you can to keep um, the indoor air clean. And as soon as the smoke event passes, um, open up the doors and windows and let the fresh air in again. Um, Air purifiers are partially effective. Indoor plants, sadly, they're lovely to have around. Um, probably good for, you, good for you psychologically, but not so good for reducing air pollution. Masks are ineffective, um, may give a false sense of security. The exception being your, your very, very um, good fitting um, N95 or P2 masks, but with pregnant women with their increased work of breathing, um, that's not ideal and they, they're really quite unsuitable for pregnant women, particularly over longer periods of time. Um, great advice just in general, when you're walking the kids to school, avoid the busy roads, avoid rush hour if you can, if you're going out to exercise and walk a few streets back. Um, and there are some fantastic apps. Aerator is one that was developed in Tasmania and that sort of will give you a good um, idea of current and forecast air pollution in your area. So I'll just return to Jess briefly. Um, gosh, what can you tell her? Um, Jess is a real person. She was a, a patient I saw back when the Tasmanian fires were, born, were burning the year before the um, big mainland fires. I had very little idea at the time. I said, oh, gosh, that sounds really hard. Um, I don't know what I could have told her if I did know more, I don't know how I could have helped her. She, she was really stuck. She had no way out of her situation. Um, she came to our hospital at 26 weeks. So two weeks after I saw her in an outpatient clinic and delivered a preterm 26 week baby who died after a few days of life. Um, and I think that experience has been one of the things that has motivated me to find out a lot more about um, these environmental effects on pregnancy and to do what I can, including talking like this to, to try and um, 
yeah, to see what we as as a community can do to, to stop this. So just to finish up gender and disaster, firstly, the global perspective, and, and we know that disaster events are increasing due to climate change and associated political instability, everything. Uh, so women and children are 14 times more likely than men to die during a disaster. Uh, the causes are, there's probably a lot, you know, there's a number of causes, um, depends a bit on where it occurs, but in certainly in some cultures, boys may be given prefer preferential treatment when it comes to rescue or resources. Women may have less physical strength, may be unable to swim, more likely to already be suffering from malnutrition, um, may have less access to warning systems. Um, and a lot of the time, they can't look after themselves because they're also protecting vulnerable family members. In the aftermath of disaster, they may be unwilling to use shelters because of gender norms or very well-founded fears of sexual violence. So to quote um, Margareta Wallström, it is a plain and simple truth that disasters reinforce, perpetuate and increase gender inequality and make bad situations worse for women. Um, they're vulnerable in the aftermath of disaster to disease, infectious disease, poor nutrition, poor um, psychological outcomes. They have that increased burden of care, increased levels of sexual and gendered violence and human traffic, trafficking are shown again and again and again in different places in the aftermath of disaster. And obviously they've also got that loss of access to reproductive health care. And so disaster has been shown to be, well, conflict, displacement and disaster are thought to account for over half of under five deaths and three in five preventable maternal deaths. In Australia, it may not be as pronounced as in other countries, but we, we have gender inequity too. And so this is, this is a fantastic report that looks at the impact of women's health on women's health of climatic and economic disaster. So we're seeing more women in an inadequate housing, more women in risk prone localities, fewer resources to escape or adapt, more likely to have responsibility to dependence, which um, is relevant both in the acute phase of the disaster, but also affecting return to work. Um, we see an increase in domestic violence and we see how disaster recovery tends to focus on rebuilding infrastructure rather than community and is thus more likely to work to result in paid work for men. And I think if we just look back at the last few years in COVID, which I guess is a sort of slow moving natural disaster, didn't we see exactly all of this? Um, so I guess in summary, women are high, highly vulnerable to the effects of climate change, both um, acute and chronic. They're the vast majority of people who've been displaced by climate change and the, they make up the majority of, of the world's poor who are living on a dollar or less a day. They tend to be involved in activities where they're much more exposed to um, environmental degradation and environmental threats, less likely to be involved in decision-making roles. And the gender differences in deaths are pretty much directly linked to differences in economic and social rights. It's not that women are intrinsically more vulnerable. Um, so population, I sort of shy away from talking about a bit because it is so complex and so fraught, but I sort of felt like I couldn't talk about reproductive health and not mention it. The IPCC say that the two main drivers of climate change are overconsumption and population growth. And you can certainly see from this first chart that population growth is accelerating and particularly in Africa and, and Asia. But the other thing to keep in mind is that the countries with the lower fertility rates are the ones with the highest per capita emissions. And if you look at the left-hand side of this graph, the countries with the highest fertility rates tend to have the lowest per capita emissions. And in fact, what's been shown is if you lower fertility rates in a country, then with increasing wealth, you get increase, increasing consumption and emissions actually increase. So it is, it is just not that simple. It's also not simple because you just can't charge in there and say, for the environment, or for whatever reason, for your own good, we're going to reduce the population. Um, attempts to limit population growth can be, or can be perceived to be, which is just as important, related to 
political, racist, classist, or in cases, genocidal agendas. They can be perceived to be attempts to control women's bodies, interfere with family autonomy and privacy, uh, furthering the interests of large corporations, furthering capitalist agendas of getting more women out to work. And what we very, very much see is that it's all the fault of population. It's an excuse for inaction in other areas. So I've just got that quote there from um, a very interesting uh, feminist critique um, of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation that goes through a lot of these things. And so really, I think no matter how well-intentioned we are, we have to be really careful about going in and saying, got to reduce population. We can think about it the other way around. What if we just go in there and give women access to reproductive technology and reproductive and family planning as they want it under their own terms, um, give them access to education, increase the status of women in societies. All of these things have been linked to um, deep declines in population growth and smaller family size. Um, so I, I really feel that population um, decline, I guess, or you know, decline in population growth should be seen as possibly a happy side effect of other things that we should be doing anyway. And certainly the benefits of family planning, um, it's a, about 217 million worldwide would like to avoid a pregnancy and are unable to do so. And if these women had access to modern contraceptives, it's estimated maternal deaths would de be reduced by about a quarter. Family planning allows women to um, earn more, complete their educations, look after their family better, and it's better for economies as a whole. So I just wanted to finish with a brief discussion of the power of empowerment, because it's good to finish on a, on a, uh, on a sort of um, positive note. So time and again, across nations and cultures, women have been shown to be more concerned than men about environmental issues, more accepting of climate science, more likely to understand it, um, less likely to say that they understand it. Um, they're overrepresented in the membership of grassroots environmental organisations and they're more likely to show pro-environmental behaviours. And looking at countries with a gr greater proportion of women in parliament, which is sort of taken as a proxy for the status of women in society, uh, we, those countries are more likely to ratify environmental treaties and actually more likely to have lower per capita carbon emissions. But once again, it's not just as women aren't intrinsically more vulnerable, there's not, there's not this woo-woo thing about women being intrinsically more in contact with nature. Um, once again, it comes down to society and culture. So women are placed, you know, they're, they, they tend to assume a more caring role, whereas men are more likely to be dependent for their jobs on industries where, you know, fossil fuels are important. Um, the... And women don't go into parliament and just sort of head straight into environmental action. In fact, they're just really likely to vote along party lines. What's really interesting is that more women in parliament is associated with a decrease in corruption. So women are actually more likely to be anti, have an anti-corruption stance in parliament. And because there's a very, very strong link between corruption in a society and environmental degradation, that is probably um, a more major factor than the way women vote in parliament. Overall though, it's just, I think that a society that values women is also the society that values the environment. So it's really about the top left hand of my um, first slide. Um, it's about society, it's about culture, it's about values. So final slide, a quote from my hero, Mary Robinson. Um, Climate change is a man-made problem with a feminist solution. That's fabulous. Thanks, Christine. That was such an excellent presentation. Um, that last thing that you said of, um, you know, a society that values women is uh, more likely to be a society that values the environment. It's like, um, you know, is the climate crisis is kind of an extension of toxic masculinity in that way. And I just find that just a really wonderful place to end on. I found that, I find that really fascinating the way you sort of bring us there, Christine. I think the way you, the arc of your talk is amazing. Um, and to all those men that are listening, it's not you. 
<laughs> also nothing intrinsically bad about men either it's it's no. um once again it's, it's a cultural thing um so yeah. yeah yeah absolutely absolutely we're all we're all product of our cultures aren't we and you know that's really what we need to be changing is we need this cultural shift um I just want to say hello to Anna hi Anna how are you hi everyone thank you for having me I'm well thank you I was um driving in the rain got here a bit late but I made it and I just want to introduce the beautiful disappear disappearing tan behind me on Kunanyi which is uh, Mount Wellington in Hobart yeah. Nipaluna um, a beautiful place and uh, just to say thank you so much Christine that's the second time I've heard uh, your uh, presentation the other one that you showed me but that one was even richer and better and uh, so I really enjoyed listening to or that. Just all keep over tweaking. Again. It. Just keep tweaking it. <laughs> yeah, no, it's perfect. It's building in a beautiful, in a beautiful fashion. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering, um, is there anybody in the audience that has any questions that they'd like to ask, whether they want to write it in the chat or in the Q and A bit? Um, um, as far as sharing print screens of these slides on social media. Um, Christine, would you be upset about that or is that something that you'd be? Um, look, I am not upset at all, although I'm just a little bit aware that when I change my talk, some of the attributions <laughs> to other yeah. people's work might have fallen off. Um, that would be my only issue, but, yeah, um, please go ahead. All right. And could, I mean, one of the other options is that these are being recorded, so you could always just um, put a link to the recording and, you know, maybe the... You know how you put how long in the recording it is on your thing. Um, there is another question there. Is there a gender difference between green space and passive recreation, canopy cover, et cetera, or do we all benefit? So I think that question came up when you were doing the pregnancy mm. section, Christine. So, like, do um, women get more benefit from green spaces, I suppose, is the inference from that question. That's a really good question. I, I don't know. Um... I, I know we all benefit, um, but whether there's a um, difference in benefit, I honestly couldn't tell you. Um, yeah. 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 All right. Um, all right. And um, I'm just having a look if there's any others. Well, I've got a question because um, I find all this stuff. And I'd really be interested in both, both of your sort of thoughts on this. You know, we're at, what, 1.3 degrees of warming now roughly you know is it 1.1 1.2 1.3 whatever and you know we're projected um, with our current policy to have three degrees of warming by the end of this century or you know if we do some of the good things three degrees do you think are we going to get to a point where humans you know the reproductive risk will be so great the um you know the the stillbirth numbers will be so great that we won't reproduce ourselves did you want to say something, Anna? Yeah, what do you think? Well, about it's interesting. It's interesting. Um, I mean, I don't know if that's where we evolutionarily will end up from a from a climate perspective, but the fact that we will in increasingly be facing this from a day to day living, not into some, you know, mysterious future, but into the right now um mm -hmm. it, it's a reality as chris um has touched on in many parts of the world and i think this is the thing that we've all got to come to terms with is the fact that it's a lived experience for many people right now it's nothing into the future i know for some of us in more um, privileged parts of the world uh, it can feel like it's a little bit far off but it's um very much lived for the and uh, as chris has pointed out for a majority of women or yeah. especially women around um, the world in more resourced um, raped nations. Uh, so, mm. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. What do you think, Chris? Mm. Yeah. Um, I was actually going to make a comment very similar to a couple of things that just came up on the, on the chat, which is that it may not be effects on pregnancy that are going to cause the greatest problem, um, but effects on fertility. Um, I didn't really have time to research this properly, but I properly, but I have I have seen quite a few things in the um, press recently about low sperm counts. Not so much heat as pollution, I think. Um, 
particularly pesticides, plastic, um, and other pollutants that are related to low sperm counts and poor sperm function um, in fertility and, and miscarriage. So I think a lot of the problems are in the fertility and, and early pregnancy um, phase, if, if you're sort of talking about significant effects on our ability to um, continue yeah. as a well. place. Yeah. yeah. So we are going to find it, because of pollution, we will find it increasingly hard to conceive and because of heating and pollution, we are more likely to suffer um, bad pregnancy outcomes. Mm. And, and from there, the, the children of those pregnancies are even more vulnerable to the health effects of the environment than they would have been otherwise because they, they're, they've already got these underlying propensities, I guess, um, of, of vulnerability. Um, so, uh, mm. yeah, it, it's... It just perpetuates itself. And yeah, I, I wouldn't are. mind adding. Oh, yeah, I was just going to say that I wouldn't mind adding right about now that um, the other element that we haven't touched on quite so much beyond the ph physiological kind of health impacts on women is also the psychological. Um, and that we know uh, now in our work that we're meeting lots of young women or women who are choosing not to. Um, have children because of the concerns around the, uh, you know, the climate emergency that we're finding ourselves in. Mm -hmm. So that's another very real, um, yeah, yeah, I, conversation I that we're having as well. Yeah, lots of women choosing to, yeah, not to reproduce because of that. I've I've met a young man who's had a vasectomy for that reason. Yeah, so it's um, interesting times, isn't it? It is, um, and I and I guess. On that topic, I guess um, one of the other, you know, important links is that there is some amazing work happening in the environmental climate activists or environmental um, spaces around making sure that that element of health is not forgotten. So um, locally, we've got a group of health professionals, uh, doctors, psychologists, psychiatrists who have created a um, climate resilience network, um, which is really preparing themselves uh, to be well informed as health professionals for um, working with families in the community um, as they start to become more and more aware of what what we're facing. Yeah. Um, so that's that's really important work as well. Yeah, I think like in health we have this really excellent sort of opportunity to um, you know like we have this great advocacy role, but also because of our jobs we're very much part of um, climate resilience and. Um, Ad the adaptation side of things because we mm. have to do what we can to protect the health of our communities. Yeah, which is, um, you know, we've got a lot of work to do, us health professionals, don't we, in climate? Yeah. Um, okay. Um, so, Alma, I'd be very interested to hear, like, on your work about um, advocacy and nonviolent direct action and how you see that as whether you see that as um, part of your professional life to, you know, advocate for a safe climate? Yeah, so um, thanks for the question. And Chris has invited me, I think, with this a little bit in mind. Um, so Chris was actually one of the first people to mention uh, a local activist group that was starting to form here locally in Hobart and it's a worldwide movement. I'm sure people have heard of Extinction Rebellion which is a non-violent uh, direct action movement um, and it's premised around that civil disobedience and initially I went through all of the phases that probably most of um, the XR people go through, which is, oh, no, that sounds way too radical or that's way too whatever. Um, and then very quickly started to educate myself in the space around what what the realities were around climate change and the climate emergency. And then the penny started to drop um, in terms of my professional life and the work that I do um, with families. And particularly, you know, we work so our entire careers to uh, ensure that women have safe births and safe deliveries and safe lives and uh, all of this, this work. And then the connection with the reality um, of, well, what am I going to do yeah. about all of this? awareness or this growing awareness and um, the intersectionality of all of the elements of health and, and society at large and particularly around um, First Peoples uh, uh, justice as well, it all just started to really connect. And so um, I guess 
the bit I wanted to talk about is that my own personal journey into um, stepping bravely into civil disobedience has been, you know, a really uncomfortable journey, but uh, one that I've felt um, is in the best alignment with my professional um, work uh, as I can, you know, I, I, I find it as a civil, dis uh, a civil duty, really, a moral duty. Um, mm -hmm. And the more I've learned about that, the more I felt that. And there's lots of incredible um, uh, examples of uh, doctors, midwives, nurses, health professionals across Australia and around the world who have decided to make that um, step. And I guess I just wanted to say for uh, us in Australia, if people, most people are in Australia, um, I've done a bit of investigating around um, our APRA registration, so um, our health registration in terms of how that impacts on us when we start to step into the spaces of civil disobedience, when we're potentially putting ourselves up for arrest. Yes. And I have learnt, and I have learnt um, that it doesn't uh, impact our health registration if, as long as we're not putting the public at day in danger, and we're not putting our profession in disrepute. So, the comparison would be that as a midwife, I couldn't become arrested by protesting, for example, outside of a. a Oh. Um, um, abortion clinic but of civil disobedience around the environment APRA would look, look at that very differently um, and so that's been a, a journey and uh, I actually go to court tomorrow around a couple of arrests that um, I did participate in from acts of civil disobedience here in Hobart and so um, so far other people who are doing similar things are finding that the um, that the outcomes of those are, are rel relatively you know, don't have an impact on our professional life. So I, I guess I wanted to just yeah. name that up. If people are feeling, uh, you know, frustrated or feeling like they want to find ways of acting, because we know for, for yes. many of us that mental health act of doing, so that active hope or that feeling like you are contributing is can, can contribute to our better health as well. Wow. Good on you, Anna. I'm really good luck tomorrow. I hope it all works out okay for you. Um, and Thank I'm you. really glad you've done that because I've, I've thought about that myself, you know, with the sort of XR in South Australia of whether would I be arrested and would it matter to me professionally and not wanting to, you know, risk registration because, you know, of mm. course, we don't want that. Um, so mm. it's quite heartening to know that that's not going to, you know, be a problem. You know, and I think yeah, I mean, obviously. Obviously, when you're making a decision like that, you would want to, you know, have those conversations directly yourself and seek that advice. Yeah, um, sure. And also, I think one of the things that we say in Extinction Rebellion, that it's not just the arrestees that are an important part of that civil disobedience. For every one person arrested, there's about a crew of 20 people that are in around yeah. them, um, yeah, you know, including that, re that regenerative, you know, caring for people. It's the first aid officers. It's the regen yeah. people that are making sure that everyone's okay. There's so many important parts to play in civil disobedience. And yeah. the social science is really clear that if we can motivate 3.5% of the population through acts of nonviolence or through movements that are nonviolent, um, they have a really high success rate. So I'm here to plug, yeah. uh, you know, for all of us <laughs> to feel like we can we can be part of that movement it's let's what's see. changed um the world for a better place in so yeah. many different ways let's um be part of the solution hey you know um and as you say within xr or within within the whole advocacy movement there is so many different roles yeah. for all of us to play we just have to get on and do them like play them um i do have a couple of questions in the q and i'm aware that we've got five minutes left um but um, this one's from Deb Colville and she says, fabulous talk, Christine. Hi, Kate and Anna, thank you. Um, I'm interested to hear more about the correlation you mentioned between high portion of women in parliament, corruption and environmental destruction. Is it only numbers of women in parliament or more broadly educated women perhaps? Um, right. Let me... Um, Give me 30 seconds and I'll get the link and I'll post it. <laughs> but yeah, there was, there was a fascinating right, well, article that looked at corruption. Um, and I'm going to um, get that for you. Just give me two seconds and I'll post it into the chat. 
All right. Well, um, while you're quietly posting there, Christine, um, I just want to wonder, let's talk a little bit about microplastics because there's a question there, you know, and I think we're all a bit scared of microplastics, aren't we? Um, well, I did hear something yesterday about people recycling plastic bottles into vanilla essence. So science is incredible. People can do good things. Um, but yeah, what's the sort of thoughts about microplastics and um, fetal, you know, does, does it cross the placenta? Uh, I'm not, a, I, I, I do remember hearing recently that they have found them in the placenta. Yeah. Um, so yes, potentially. I don't know about crossing, but um, it um, has been found in the placenta. Um, I'm not aware of any research on fetal development or on sort of um, childhood mm. health, but definitely a lot of research about sort of... Um, effects on yeah look it's it's hard to pull together a lot of it's animal studies um but there are there are sort of um there, there is research on the end particularly the endocrine disrupting um effects of plastics um which i think yeah look i haven't looked at that recently it's it's once again i think it's just a whole nother talk which would be fantastic um to have um yeah. It kind of just goes into the whole, mm. you know, the way humans are living on our planet is really destructive. And every time that we sort of extract fossil fuels and use it in any way, it seems to always get us. You know, <laughs> like it just it just shows this whole sort of toxic way that we're living on our planet and you know, the sort of insanity of that. Um mm. I'm just having another little look about questions. I just want to make sure we cover things. Um Oh, about healthcare is anticipating higher and higher levels of community concerns this is from Deb Colville again. I read on Psychologists for a Safe Climate post that there are courses and networking happening in anti-climate anxiety that are accredited now. Does that sound right? Is that what Anna is talking about? Anna, do you know anything about that? Oh, I know Anna's online at the moment, who um, is one of our local GPs who's really involved in this, um, yeah. in that space. Can you repeat that question in terms of, because I missed the first part of it. Um, just basically the concepts question. about um, psychologists for a safe climate and um, courses and networks for regarding eco-anxiety. Um, I do know a little bit about that myself. I do know psychologists for a safe climate is going to be working with DEA to... Um, help sort of make climate a course on climate friendly practitioners so that um, we can offer mental health support to patients in our communities, which um, is something great. And here we have, didn't we? Oh no. Is that Anna? <laughs> uh, Anna's, Anna's just offered to speak on that briefly if you, if you want. She's yeah, sure. Chat. Yeah. Anna Seth. Yeah, what I'll have to, to do, to Anna, audio, Anna, I'm not sure. Anna, Anna Seth is the person. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, what I can do, Anna, is give me a second and I'll figure out how to allow you to speak, which is quite tricky for me. So it might take me a little while, but I do have the technology. All right. And um, I guess I wanted to while you while you're looking for that and making that work, I might just touch a little bit on what um, you spoke about just before, which is how all of those elements of the you know environmental degradation kind of all come together and impact. And I and I think one of the things that we speak about in the climate activist spaces now more and more is that we're really what we need to be moving for is um, a system change, um, you know, not just you know, looking at the climate change in that one, in that very one nar narrow way, we need to be looking at how it impacts on First Nation people, how it impacts on women, how it impacts on, you know, all of the different aspects of our um, living. And I think women, particularly um, in terms of visionaries and leadership in where we're heading forward, um, there's just so many great examples. And Anna's on there, so I'll shut up. <laughs> Thanks, Anna. Anna, can you unmute yourself or do I need to do that to you for you? Um, yes, yeah. I I can. Hello. Um, thank you. Uh, 
just to, to clarify about the psychology for a safe climate um, process. Um, so the psychology for a safe climate do um, group workshops, um, which have increasingly become online around climate anxiety and climate grief and are going through a process of um, a pathway to training for health professionals uh, who might like to upskill in that. Um, and I, I think, Kate, you probably know more than me around the accreditation, but it's quite possible that that process may well be accredited for us um, through colleges of general practice or potentially through the College of Psychiatrists for those of us that are psychiatrists. Um, so that's really exciting um, because they have a wealth of experience having worked for 10 years in this field. I think what Anna was mentioning um, earlier is to start, we have a local network within Tasmania where we're looking to bring um, health professionals and academics and community members together. And that's um, really exciting as well. And we've got good links there with um, the Extinction Rebellion Regenerative Culture team, which has been lovely. Um, yeah, that's really all, all I want to say. We might be able to um, share more about that psychology for a safe climate process as it becomes better defined and open to, um, to mm. interested DEA members who might want to take that up. Yes, and um, you know we have the DEA group that's starting, and also our next webinar um, is on climate change and the mental health effects. And um, so hopefully, you know, people can come along and do more about. We'll talk more about that then. Um, I am aware that we have just sort of run out of time. Um, Christine or Anna, is there any sort of closing comments that you'd like to make um, about women's health and climate change or I can just say thank you. Look, just thank you for um, having us and uh, allowing us to um, to talk about it. Um, and I, I can see from the chat that so many others are really passionate as well. Yeah. And maybe yeah. and yeah, look, um, maybe there could be an interest group going forward. And I'd be interested in that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, look, thank you, Christine. I have heard your talk a couple of times now and it's a fabulous talk. Um, it's just really, really informative. And as I said before, it has this beautiful narrative arc. The way you start off with sort of, you know, heat and pollution and then you end up on feminist theory, I just think is really, really fabulous. So thank you. And Anna, thank you very much for taking the time to come along and talk to us. And, you know, especially the concept of needs for advocacy and, you know, best of luck tomorrow. And I'm sure you'll be fine. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I'm sure I will. And yeah, my, my closing one is um, get involved. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, thank you. That's it. All right. All right. Well, thank you everybody for coming along tonight. And um, hopefully we'll see you at our next DEA after hours webinar. Um, next month. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks for